to introduce Mahesh Rangarajan, who is currently on deputation from his position as professor of history um, in Delhi University to head up the directorship of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. Um, in addition to Delhi University, Professor Rangarajan has taught courses in environmental history and conservation at several other institutions. From 2001 to 4, he was visiting faculty at Cornell's Department of History, which is when we met. Um, he had several stints at the Center for Ecological Sciences, um, at the Indian Institute of Science, and the National Center for Biological Sciences, which are both in Bangalore. He has helped design courses in human ecology at Ambedkar University in Delhi, in wildlife conservation at the National Center for Biological Sciences, as well as the syllabus for environmental studies at Delhi University. Um, he was a member of the founding team and editorship of the Cambridge-based journal Environment and History, as well as the Bangalore-based Conservation and Society. Um, Professor Rangarajan is a prolific writer with an encyclopedic mind, and anyone who has consulted with him on a project can attest to his capacious intellect and his generosity. Um, he's written a number of books and articles on the politics and history of wildlife conservation, forest rights, and environmental history. And there's too many to list, but I'm just going to name a few. Um, Fencing the Forest, Conservation and Ecological Change in India's Central Provinces, 1860 to 1914, came out in 1996. Um, the co-edited volume, India's environment, well, two volumes actually, India's Environmental History, volume one, volumes one and two, uh, which is co-edited with K. Shri Ramakrishnan that came out in 2012. And then there's a three-part co-edited series. Um, the first was Battles Over Nature in 2003, Making Conservation Work in 2007, and Nature Without Borders in 2014. Is that out? Oh, it's in press. It's, it's in out press. in August this year. And in addition to Nature Without Borders that's coming out in August, he's got two more books coming out. Uh, a second co-edited volume with uh, Sri Ramakrishnan titled Shifting Ground, People, Animals, and Mobility in India's Environmental Histories. And a second uh, single-authored collection of essays um, titled Nature and Nation, Essays in Environmental History, which is under review. Um, and his talk today is titled Nature Beyond Borders, Science, Society, and Conservation in India. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ajanta, for a most generous, a wildly inaccurate introduction. <laughs> What did I get wrong? I she did say wrong. we met many years ago. So one of the uh, benefits of friendship is to be extra generous, even if inaccurate to our friends. I think it's very interesting that the politics of nature is taking the kind of turn it is in the world we live in. Just looking at the Indian newspapers as we head into the 14th general election, in which there are there is there are about 810 million people who have the right to vote. The rough vote percentage is past as an indicator is, will be between 60 and 65 percent. An astonishing number of these people are young, seven out of ten are under the age of 30. They live in a country which is in the throes of change. Uh, if you look at India from 1980 on, according to some new studies, probably GDP figures keep getting revised by economists because they work very well with numbers, uh, is that maybe we've had five percent plus growth from since 1975, not 80. But definitely in the 2000s, we have a period of about eight years of 8% growth. So this rapid pace of economic expansion, of course, has very far-reaching consequences for society, for the polity, for different cultures, and of course, for the wider environmental, ecological frame within which people live. Uh, there are biophysical, hydrological changes. There's the founding of new townships, the mining of new areas, the creation of new permanent highways. There are new ports and dockyards. There are new refineries, new smelters, I could go on. But these are also taking place in a country which has a third very interesting characteristic. One is an astonishingly young population. The other is rapid economic transformation. The third, which I hinted at, of course, is that it is and has since 1952 been a vibrant democracy. Now, when you put it in this frame, it's very interesting, even in the course of an election campaign such as this one, there are references to what I may broadly call the politics of nature. So for instance, both the major parties have said that they are committed to river interlinking. These are programs spelled out 
in the 50s and the 70s, and these have been excavated and brought back. Uh, the last attempt to do this was in the 2004 election. So this grand project of interlinking the rivers, which of course will have major consequences. It's been on the back burner for the last 10 years. Speaking in Guwahati, the prime ministerial candidate of the premier opposition party said that he was committed to saving the pride of Assam, the greater one-horned rhinoceros. He also stated that he knew who the rhino poachers were and they'd better watch out because they would settle scores with them. Interestingly, uh, there's a very important court intervention yesterday. There are a slew of dams being built across the Himalaya. 24 dams which had been proposed in the hill state of Uttarakhand. Uh, there was a litigant uh, following the recent earthquake and the court has put a stay on 23 of 24 dams. Uh, there are other issues which are, which are wider. The BJP in its manifesto says it will create a national mission to save the Himalaya. And it's really realized uh, that the Himalaya and Trans-Himalaya occupy some 12% of India's land area. It's a greater part of the landmass than the Gangetic Plain, though it has fewer people. Uh, the Congress has said that it believes there should be something called a national ecological audit. They should bring the service of neoclassical economics to know how to value nature so that we don't damage it while expanding our economy. So India's, of course, has been in part the story of the planet in the 20th century. In a very interesting book uh, published appropriately enough in the year 2000, John McNeil said that the, the 20th century had no precedent in world history. The population of the world grew fourfold and the world's Gross world product rose 14-fold. So if you just looked at sheer numbers, it's the economic expansion, which was at a much faster pace than the demographic expansion. And I think in the Indian case, uh, the demographics has to be kept somewhere in the picture. It's not a unilinear picture, but this is a country which has 400 people to a square kilometer. That is a lot of people. If you consider that in the 1880s, it was about 70 to a square kilometer. In 1600, it was 35 to a square kilometer. I live in the city of Delhi, which has 14 million people. Second century of the common era, if Shumit Guha's estimates are correct, the total population of the subcontinent was 20 million. So there is a relationship with demography, but more than the number of people, it's what they do. And what is very striking is there are new computations of India at the time of Akhwa in about 1600. Only a fourth of the landscape was under permanent tillage. Today, it's about half. So you have very large epochal changes which we're living through. Given these, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, if you look at the biological diversity of India, it's not just a country of a billion people, it's also a country of, I think at last count, 534 mammals, probably over 1,200 species of birds, some 25,000 species of flowering plants. In the 1970s, there was a very interesting coup, you know, talking about the overlap of politics and wildlife. It's a coup most historians have missed. There was a coup of animals, not people. Uh, the Indian government uh, decided that the lion, which had been the national animal since 1952, should be replaced by the tiger. <laughs> uh, when he was asked why this change was being brought about, the chairman of the Indian Board for Wildlife, full disclosure, he happens to be the chairman of the executive council of my organization, and he himself was from a princely family, and he had had the nickname from a young age, Tiger. So <laughs> he was asked, why has the tiger been made the national animal? And he said that the tiger is a symbol of the unity in diversity of India. It is found in 11 of the 16 states, while the lion is found in only one state. The lion, he clarified, continues to enjoy full protection and will continue to be on the, uh, the national emblem of India. The national emblem of India, as you know, is the Ashokan pillar, which has these snarling, or if you like, growling lions. Interestingly, the lion from the 50s and certainly by the 90s had become a symbol of Gujarati regional nationalism. There's a big debate, there's a court case proceeding on whether lions can be moved from this last population in Asia to part of their former range in central India. And uh, there's a lot of Gujarati asmita or nationalism or regional pride associated with the lion, just as there is an Assam with the rhino. So I think it's very interesting that these animals become markers for political identity. And... Uh, in becoming markers for political identity, uh, this marking may also help secure their future, not just in terms of individual animals, but of species and protection of their forest home. When we come to this, we are struck by something very interesting, which is that world over, in different societies, different polities, different nation states, setting aside and secluding certain areas for nature has become a layat motif of conservation. Uh, the World Conservation Union estimated in 
the 1980s that some 6% of the terrestrial area of the world is in national parks or sanctuaries or reserves. I think the figure now is closer to 12%. In India, it's about 6%. But 6% is a lot of land in a country with so many people and so much activity. You're also struck not just by the land which is protected, but by the fact that if you look at large taxa, I'll take them because they're easier to deal with, the number of species which have become extinct since 1600, which is used as a baseline internationally, in India is actually only five. You'd expect it to be more. And interesting which five they are. There are two species of rhinoceros, and India was the eastern edge of their range, the Javan and the Sumatran. There's a local subspecies of the red deer found in Sikkim. There's a species of wild cattle. It's right at the edge of its eastern edge of its range, the Banteng. And there's, of course, a very well-known animal whose name derives originally from Sanskrit, the cheetah, which comes from a Sanskrit word, siratraka, the spotted one. It was here till about the late 1960s. So there's a very major transformation in India in the late 60s, early 70s. And the phrase which has been used quite validly is one of ecological patriotism. It's a belief in the late 60s that to secure India's future, just as you protected the, the cultural monuments and heritage, you also ought to protect the natural heritage. This was exemplified very interestingly in the crisis years of the late 60s. As you know, in 66, uh, just as in 2014, we went through a very exciting election. A Congress party emerged battered and bruised. Uh, within three years, it was on the verge of a split. The Congress broke up in 1969. And at the helm of the Congress was a very young uh, woman leader, Mrs. Indira Gandhi. And in 1969, she was fighting for her political life. She did many things, but one of them was to put the protection of natural heritage right at the center of her political agenda. In 1969, the International Union for Conservation of Nature had its meeting in New Delhi. Naturally, the Prime Minister addressed it. And she said in her address, I quote, that we do need foreign exchange, but not at the cost of the life and liberty of some of the most beautiful furred and feathered inhabitants of our land. The tiger is now in danger of extinction. The export of tiger and leopard skins has been banned. We are also considering steps to protect animals such as the rhinoceros and the elephant." Unquote. I just wanted to note something very interesting. She defined animals and birds as furred and feathered inhabitants of our land. And it's a very interesting phase of a certain kind of left-wing politics in Mrs. Indira Gandhi's. Uh, rain because it's this year that there are steps against the privy purses of the princes, many of whom, many of whom ran shikar companies and who totted up huge bags of tigers and leopards and such like. It's also a time when they nationalize banks. And this is a time when they are arguing that they have to secure the natural heritage with strong federal action to protect these refugia for wildlife. By 1972, when they declared the tiger the national animal, they launched a very important project, Project Tiger, and there is a new enactment, the Wildlife Protection Act. So in a sense, there is a sort of ecological patriotism which funds and enables the creation of these safe havens for wildlife in different states. It's a very small scheme if you look at it by present day standards. Its total funding is about 40 million rupees. The number of tiger reserves was nine. Today, there are 50 tiger reserves. But I think there's something very significant which is happening over here. One is this notion of unity and diversity is expanding to include a diversity of landscapes. So whereas Indian forestry going back to the 1860s and 70s had concentrated on timber, on maximizing output, in her speech, Mrs. Gandhi deplored attitudes and policies which are intent on squeezing the last rupee of our forests. Forests, she went on to say, cannot be seen from a narrow accountant's point of view. I just want to emphasize here that one of her early speeches is made in January 1967. Uh, political leaders love to go to universities. They put on robes, they give given honorary degrees, and they make learned speeches. I don't know who wrote the speech, but it's a very interesting speech. She, she, she says, I, I paraphrase, our country is in the throes of an unprecedented drought. At such a time, we are reminded of the importance of forests. Relentless deforestation for large projects may be inevitable, but we need to keep a check on it. These forests are the security for our future. And you can see, therefore, linkages being made between denudation of forests, the loss of soil, the decline of the availability of water. And this is a very interesting trope. It goes back to the early 19th century to 
surgeons and botanists who worked for the East India Company state or polity who were arguing that there were links between forests, the hydrological cycle, and instability in agriculture. The World Wildlife Fund raised a million dollars and they brought out a pamphlet. I don't have a copy, but it's very interesting. The pamphlet had three pictures. It had a picture of a snake swallowing a rodent. And it said, did you know that snake skins uh, destroy so many snakes per year and snakes are the check on rodents which eat so much valuable grain. It also had a delightful picture of a bird of some indeterminate species stuffing a fledgling with lots of insects. You could make out they were insects. And it said a fledgling eats three times its weight in insects per day and is a friend of the farmer. And then it had a denuded hillside and it said denudation costs the country so much in floods and droughts. So, you know, the tiger here becomes, if you like, a symbol. It's not just saving an animal, it's saving it in, in situ, that is, it's to be protected with its prey and its habitat. And uh, the, the director of Project Tiger, Kailash Sankla, who Kamal will recall very, very vividly, uh, was asked at the first press conference, what do you intend to do? And he caused a stir because he said the policy of Project Tiger can be summed up in two sentences, to do nothing and to let and to not let anybody do anything. So everybody wondered what he was saying. And he said, we're going to let nature run its course. If the, if the wood rots, it shall stay there. If there are wild predators like wild dogs, there won't be bounties on them. So this notion that you withdraw human biomass removal and allow nature to recover. Looking back, it's interesting that in some senses, these projects did succeed. There are new estimates of tigers which say there are probably only 1,700 in India. When Project Tiger began, there were 1,800. This is widely regarded as a symbol of failure. As student of history, I will submit it can be interpreted as a symbol of success because India has two times twice as many people today as it did when it was launched. It has much wider penumbra of economic activities. It's true. If these habitats were better protected, they could hold maybe 3,000 tigers. But it's a very unusual Asian country where there is such sustained significance given to the protection of natural heritage. This has an older history. One can go back to the 1930s and 40s, Jawaharlal Nehru's interventions in 48 to protect the lions of the Gir Forest, to save the hunting reserve of the Keladev Ghana near Delhi from being drained uh, for distribution of land to farmers. They did distribute the land, but it was done elsewhere. Uh, it's around the same time, 1949, and I think there's a connection here, that when informed that uh, there were Harappan remains of the Indus Valley civilization of 5,000 years ago in the Gujarat port town of Lothal, Nehru not only intervened, but had a committee of archaeologists, a team formed, and on the spot within one week. So I think there is a sense of a newly independent nation finding a voice in the international committee through a language of peace, and peace with its past because it embraces the diversity of cultures, and peace with the future because it sees nature as part of that future. However, and I think this is where this, this talk really has to focus on what I hope to talk about today, this idea of enclosing nature, of creating protected zones, while vital, because untrammeled economic activity and human presence can transform these lands rapidly, causing irretrievable loss. Hmm? So I'm not suggesting, and we are not suggesting that it is not a valid idea, but we want to qualify it and argue that it's enough, but not sufficient. It's necessary, but you have to go further. Uh, what follows is the result of a large book in which a lot of people have participated and why Two colleagues, M.D. Madhusudan and Ghazala Shahbuddin, very distinguished uh, ecologists. This is part of our joint work. And very simply put, we'd argue that the idea of enclosing nature in order to secure it may actually break a continuum. A continuum between the landscapes that are protected within and those which are not protected without. Nature, interestingly, seldom respects the borders that people draw. This should be self-evident, but let me illustrate. One of the very interesting features of India over the last 12 years has been that if you look up at the sky, there are no vultures. There are three species of vultures. I won't bore you with all the details of their names, but they're very common across much of India. India, as you know, houses not only one out of six people on earth or seven people on earth, it also has one out of every five cattle on earth. So we have several varieties of domestic ruminants. Along with the cow and the buffalo, there are less well-known ones, there are sheep, there are goats, there are mules, there are yaks, there are camels, there are mithuns, there are zoos. And I may have left some species <laughs> out. Because of this large population of domestic ruminants, vultures 
they didn't exactly have a feast but they were not wanting for food but over the last 15 years 95 to 97 percent of the vultures in pakistan india bangladesh have died out this was first noticed in the bird reserve of bharatpur vibhu prakash in the 1990s uh, would do counts of vulture nests the vultures were building nests they were laying eggs but the eggs weren't hatching people in the united states would be familiar at one time this was the story of the bald eagle or the peregrine falcon which have since recovered it turned out it took 5 to 6 years to find out why it wasn't pesticides it was a veterinary medicine called diclofenac which individual cultivators or stock owners use to inject their cows buffaloes pigs whatever mm -hmm. and when the animals die the diclofenac travels upward and it lodges itself in the bodies of the vultures and the chemical signal which has to be given for eggshell thickness doesn't work this is how bird populations died out in the us with the peregrine falcon uh, the bald eagle now whatever you do vultures cross boundaries even the vultures with nest within the ghana have to forage well beyond for food you could multiply this over working in the oldest indian national park set up in the 1930s haley unusual park named after independence for an englishman normally in india after independence they rename the things which are named after englishman it's an unusual case there was a man eating man who famous for hunting man eaters a great writer of shikar stories jim cobbett so cobbett national park so fascinating ornithologist called rishad nauroji uh, we have a young distinguished scholar who finished his thesis in 4 years rishad nauroji labored on the same book for 25 years it's a magnificent book it's called the birds of prey of south asia he's photographed all the 70 diurnal birds of prey in all kinds of plumage and each has about four types of plumage so it took him 25 years to photograph them. he looked at a species of spotted eagle which nests within the cobbard park this is even before vibhu prakash found the same story and here it was pesticides so chemical compounds cross borders one of the other entities that crosses borders is more complex it's a social entity the market uh, assam which protects its rhinos there are armed bodyguards patrolling the borders of kaziranga and manas is considering dehorning the rhinos so you know the great indian one horn rhino may have to be renamed the great indian hornless rhino because they're going to lop off the horn so that poachers don't shoot it because they don't know how to contend with the market for the horn and this of course is true not just within india india historically has also been a great vacuum and a suction force for wild animal products from beyond across the last 2000 years african ivory found a destination not only to japan but to india because the african elephant has longer tusks the females also have tusks in southern india we have some of the most intensively studied asian elephant populations in the world the ratio of male to female is 1 to 100 so not because of anything the elephants did but because poachers have got all the males even the young younger ones with small tushes so just as animals and birds cross borders chemicals cross borders the market crosses borders and these fortresses the the, the model of fortress conservation sometimes isn't able to stop it there can also be harmless seemingly harmless extractions which can transform the ecologies of forests for the worse the ecologists reni bojes works on something much less glamorous than predators she works on pollinators and she did some fascinating work many years ago in a small community forest reserve this is the other way one one answer to conservation is bring up the drawbridges man the fortresses better equip the guards and we can secure these havens i have explained to you why it won't work because nature spills beyond borders markets may break through the fortress but does this work at the community level before we even look at human hierarchies of class caste race gender she showed some fascinatingly well protected sacred groves but the sacred groves were embedded in a larger forest where people were allowed to gather dry twigs why were they collecting dry twigs not to burn them but for a product which all of us enjoy tomatoes tomatoes are born on plants which are vines they are buffeted by the winds so the vines are tied to twigs and the twigs come from the forest except that these dry twigs were vital for the reproductive cycle of a couple of pollinators which were becoming extinct in large parts of the forest therefore transforming its floral composition so we have a fascinating situation where nature cannot actually be secluded within a reserve what do you do then not what then but what now let me now try and illustrate a, a couple of very serious instances about what kinds of responses can be there one of the early tiger reserves was a place called bandipur 
it's uh, in the southern Indian state of Karnataka. It's bordered by three other large national parks. It's part of a complex of eight reserves, probably one of the largest areas of natural or less human impacted forest left in southern India. Only two of the large vertebrates found here are extinct in the, in the greater Bandipur ecosystem, the cheetah and the nilgai. But Bandipur, when it was studied by my colleague M.D. Madhusudan, still supports six large wild ruminants, ranging from the mouse deer to the very large Asian elephant. But Bandipur also, every day, between morning, dusk, between dawn and dusk, hosts 100,000 cattle. The cattle come in, they graze, and they go home. Nobody can stop the cattle, because the cattle are owned by smallholders and large landowners who live on its rim. None of them poach, none of them kill animals. But without these cattle going into the forest, they would find making a living very difficult. Now, the earlier conservation answer was to man the fortress and shut it. A small part of the forest has been stopped for grazing. The rest of it, it's not possible to stop it. One reason is very simple. Many of the forest guards are recruited from these very families. But the other, which Madhusudan decided to do, is to ask not how we can stop the cattle, but why do people send cattle into the forest? He published a paper which came in Ambio in 2003. It's a very fascinating paper. He soon discovered the main product of these cattle was not milk or hides, but cow dung. And the cow dung was not being used, but sold. It went to the nearby hills where they grew coffee, particularly the organic variety. And the price of cow dung would spike when international prices of organic coffee went up. Why were these people collecting cow dung and selling it for coffee? The answer is they needed ready cash. Why did they need ready cash? Because most of them were servicing loans. What was the rate they paid on the loan? 35 to 40 percent. So unless you came up with an answer to that, they would continue to send cattle into the forest. This is the second impact the forest had on the people living outside. For some six months, I headed a very interesting small group of experts who knew a lot. I knew nothing about it, called the Elephant Task Force. Among other things, we were supposed to devise and come up with answers for human-elephant conflict. Bandipur has very little poaching. Some of the big tuskers have been taken. But elephants come out of Bandipur and they raid crops at night. They're very destructive. Sometimes it's individual bull elephants. Increasingly, we find groups of females with young. The farmers have a very difficult time. Uh, Madhu and others have computed. There are, the picture changes every 20 kilometers. There are people who spend 100 to 150 days a night, 100, 100 to 150 nights a year, out in the field with a torchlight, a bell in hand, firecrackers and a lantern trying to chase elephants away. Mm. The forest department's answer is to build a fence around the forest. We spent a fascinating morning and then probably the man who knows Indian elephants best on the ground is the person who never finished his doctorate, very great scholar Ajay Desai, he dragged me aside and showed me that at night a bull elephant had crawled under the wire into the trench, come out on the other side, foraged and come back. <laughs> they are incredibly agile animals. You cannot keep them out with a fence around the forest. The fence anyway has been broken in several places. I'm sure you guessed it, people have to bring their cattle in in the day. When they shut it at night, the elephant will get through from somewhere. It's not just elephants. If you look at the grazing lands around Bandipur, you find spotted deer, you find wild dogs. It's very interesting. There's a lookout sentinel watching you, gives a whistle and the dogs run away. So the animals within the forest mm -hmm. depend on the hinterland beyond. I can illustrate this much better with the lions of the Gir forest. The protected area of the Gir is less than 2,000 square kilometers. At last count this year, the full home range of the lions is 20,000 square kilometers. Mm -hmm. You can do it with elephants. So the range of elephants in India is over 110,000 square kilometers. Just about 60,000 is protected. So, this project of enclosing nature doesn't work. The natural elements or the biota for which these lands are protected or waters are protected need the lands and waters beyond. The people living around need the resources within. My colleague uh, Ghazala Shahabuddin did a fascinating book on the tiger reserve of Sariska, the first tiger reserve where the tiger became extinct. And uh, it's since been restocked. But she argued that Sariska's problem was not poaching of tigers. It was the fact that there was large-scale extraction of wood for sale of firewood in the nearby city. And the people picking it up were suffering from what she called an acute livelihood crisis. For them, the option to not cutting wood was not earning enough money for a living. So what do you do in these situations? I must emphasize that the communities of conservation are very divided on how to respond to such a crisis. Even those who agree that we ought to do something 
do not agree on what needs to be done and even when we agree on what needs to be done we don't agree on who ought to do it the reason for this of course is that much of conservation or if you like preservation in india builds on an older tradition there's the tradition of the raj going back to the late 19th century there's one young indian boy whom all of you have heard of even if you have never seen the films in which he stars mowgli uh, written about by kipling in the jungle books the first chapter of the jungle books was published in 1893 it's called in the rook and it tells you what happened at the end of mowgli's life he became a forest guard <laughs> and kipling praises him for chasing away the goats of the villagers which will eat up the saplings which will grow up to be mighty oaks which will provide timber for the railways so the literary lion of the british empire got it right so there's that raj tradition and parks such as haley uh, areas such as kaziranga where the elephant where elephant and rhino live were to grow out of this raj tradition they not only secured the timber they secured the large game some of this was far sighted we were in england itself the first mammal in england to get protection was an animal called the grey seal it, it's a seal it lives in the sea this was in 1914 The first animal to get protection to a substantial degree in British India was the elephant in 1879. Even earlier, in the presidency of Madras in 1873. So it's not just an imperial import into the Orient East. There are there are traditions in the British Indian Empire. The other, of course, which we shouldn't forget, which is why I mentioned Gir and Bandipur, is the tradition of the Indian princes. The princes ruled over a third of India's landscape. Uh, some of them with extremely brute with extreme brute force. enforced labor exactions on peoples of the forest they protected large animals which ravaged the crops a remarkable work of ann gold a paper called wild pigs and kings the peoples of this little state of savar the ghatiali raj remember the savar raj as a time of great pleasure and pain pleasure because they could go and collect pilu berries and thatch grass from the uh, scrublands but a time of great pain because great sounders of wild boar came out of the jungle and destroyed their crops which they were not allowed to protect in self defense so in the riyasats of the princely states as well as in british india people were disarmed they didn't have the right to bear arms you know you're in a country where the right to bear arms is very important they didn't have the right to bear arms in self defense of their crops and there is a third tradition which i think must be postmarked which is less important in indian state craft which is the tradition of community protection and control Ajanta has done some remarkable work on the environmental history of Tamil Nadu. Uh, the great naturalist who worked in Tamil in, in India for many years, he wrote a column for 48 years. That was a bread and butter. Was a man called M. Krishna. Krishna was a great uh, exponent of a form of ecological patriotism, and he gave a fascinating lecture in 1979 on the crisis of conservation in India. He said there were two roads to conservation. The first he said was the Asokan road. He referred to the Arthashas, the manual of statecraft. Uh, probably composed third century before the common era but comes into present form if scholars are to be believed third century of the common era so bce is probably when it starts but the written version coalesces around 1700 years ago the arthashastra talks of hastavanas elephant forests it even says something relevant today it says it defines the breadth of the road in the city the breadth of the road in the village and the breadth of the road in the elephant forest the city roads are the widest the village roads are narrower and the elephant forests are narrower still it even tells you that in the ideal kingdom the elephant forests are to be at the edge not at the center because the center there are farmers and the bull elephants will ravage their crops so this was the tradition of you know princely protection of fiat and i'm sure you've guessed it that the shastra gives a very simple sentence for the poacher of an elephant death The elephants are very important for the war machines of the of the kings. They had to capture them and use them as mounts in warfare. But Krishna was very honest. He said, "There's another tradition," and he referred to a place which is a misnomer if there ever was one. A place called Vedan Tangal, which is very close to Chennai, Madras. Vedan means hunter. Tangal refers to tank. As you know, India, unlike England, has the same average rainfall, 110 centimeters. But there's a difference. It, it rains almost every day in england it doesn't rain for 10 days they go out on a picnic but in india there are sharply defined wet and dry seasons and one of the results is that there are lots of wading birds stocks egrets herons which spread across the countryside but need a place to nest when the rains come and they nest together for a very simple reason now studied in great detail by evolutionists and ecologists that if they come together in a group the chances of a predator getting at them are low 
There's danger from the ground, mongooses or jackals, and there's danger from the sky, falcons or eagles. They solved this by nesting where there are trees standing in water. And Vedan Tangal was such a place. The local oral tradition said that it had been protected for 1800 years. In 1793, however, a team of British soldiers, East India Company soldiers, excuse me, went in and did the unthinkable. They shot some birds and ate them. The villagers then went to the collector, a man called Lionel Price, who then issued a call, a proclamation that this was an ancient custom of this particular village and these birds had to be respected. So Krishnan said, I respect the tradition of Vedan Tangal, but we don't have the time for it. Mm. We're in a crisis. We have to take the road of Ashoka. Vedan Tangal is the most desirable, but Ashoka is what is necessary. <laughs> this is a big debate. Uh, there are Indian ecologists, one of them actually trained at Harvard down the road, Madhav Gadgil, the first man who brought population biology to India, wrote a number of books. In the 1970s, around the time Project Tiger was being launched, he wrote an article on sacred groves, which was rejected by a scientific journal, which he then later published elsewhere. And he argued that sacred groves are the answer. I have explained why sacred groves may not be the answer. There are lots of other reasons. There are local hierarchies of gender. There are hierarchies of class. They are also very small in size and so on. But what I want to emphasize is that in this debate between the centralized fortress conservation model, and the decentralized, let communities do it their way more. There's a vast medium terrain. <laughs> and what we're trying to do is to push the envelope with the medium terrain. What better place to begin than the Tiger Reserve of Bandipur? There are not just 100,000 cattle going in every day. And remember, the cattle are degrading the forest. They're taking nutrients out of the forest, which are not going back because the cow dung goes away. You can't stop people going there, but you can try to ask to create conditions by which they send less cattle into the forest rather than more. There's a second set of human influences in the forest. There are 20,000 families who depend on the forest for firewood. They harvest dead wood because they're not allowed to cut living trees. The forest guards will penalize them. On average, each family extracts two tons of wood per year. So there are a lot of biomass coming out of the forest. Again, you can't stop them. So there are two kinds of approaches that have been attempted. One is by a forum which the forest department has helped, which two very good wildlife photographers or locally resident have helped set up called the Namasanga. It's a cooperative. It does the obvious. Provide a 100% subsidy on a cooking range and a substantial subsidy on gas cylinders. 15 of the 20,000 families have switched. One major reason is women do not want to spend many hours in the forest, which is dangerous, not because of tigers, but because of sloth bears, elephants, snakes, bees, what have you. The other 5,000 can't afford even the subsidized rate. But it's a substantial decline, even if they've not shifted 100% from fire. The other is more complex. Rather than fence the forest and keep the elephants in, because remember, uh, at least in the Asian context, certainly in India, the fence will get built every year. The trenches will get filled when there's a monsoon. There's a great incentive for the contractor building the fence to keep getting a yearly contract. And remember, the elephants and other animals are getting through anyway. So the other answer is not to fence the forest, but to fence the field. But what do you do with the field? The average farm size in India, 80% of the holdings, are less than 2 hectares. So you can't do it alone. Whatever the answer is, it can't be done by the individual cultivator. So what Madhusudan tried to do is to get, and succeeded over the last 10 years, won some awards, though it's very early days, is a group of cultivators have put a fence together. Fence is done with a subsidy. It's got a mild electric shock to deter elephants, and it's got a wire running very close to the ground to deter another extremely destructive animal, the wild boar. Over a few years, these people have on their own stopped sending their cattle into the forest. They've put in tube wells. They've shifted from a single to a double crop. They've joined a dairy cooperative, and their dependence on the forest has gone down. Now, there is a problem. When you address these problems of smallholders protecting crops, when you try to address the issue of people who need alternative fuel, uh, I'll add a third. There are certain large animals which range over vast areas. I referred to the tiger, but let me give you a much more fascinating animal. One I think is amazing. It was first filmed hunting in the wild five years ago. It was first photographed in the wild in 1974. It's appropriately called the phantom of the mountain peaks, the snow leopard. It's even been reclassified. Uh, under the Linnaean classification, it was called Felis Uncia. 
then they divided felis up it seems the big cats have round pupils and can roar while the small cats have slits and they purr but but the snow leopard's different it's now called uncia uncia it has various physiological characteristics which enable it to live in the high mountain areas but the snow leopard is a very destructive animal there's no record of it attacking a human being but they take a lot of sheep and a lot of goats in the 1990s in india and parallelly in across the various snow leopard mountain states researchers working on the snow leopard decided that to protect the snow leopard you had to partner with the herders so in spiti this is starts on a small scale insurance schemes to protect stock and stockholders and their interests but it expands into creating small zones where there is zero grazing of livestock with full compensation this is easier to do here hierarchies are less pronounced than in the plains people are able to cooperate and this is now being attempted across the five snow leopard states in all of these there's a simple principle you don't treat people who depend on nature for a livelihood as a problem you try to address their problem by getting involved with a different model of conservation by trying to redress the problem you don't just reduce the debt that is extracted from nature or the natural system you also create positive incentives to enable conservation to proceed more easily we are not suggesting and want to be very clear that these fluid mobile systems always work let me give you one where we don't know how it will work uh there's very interesting work on the indian coastline uh, india as you know is emerging as a major power in terms of seafood exports a lot of seafood exports prawns shrimp and so on one of the major instruments of extracting seafood developed originally in wartime technologies deployed in peace time is the trawler and trawlers particularly on the coromandel coast and on the malabar coast the east and the west having exhausted several large species of fish are now picking up what is called bycatch these are tiny fingerlings which no human being will eat they found a use for them they chop them into chips or break them into bits and feed them to poultry india is going through a poultry revolution the amount of poultry produced is three times of 10 years ago and it's cheaper anecdotal evidence from people who work on terrestrial ecological systems suggests that in many hill areas the younger generation even if they have a gun don't want to go and shoot wild meat because they can buy and eat a broiler chicken <laughs> so the fish are subsidizing some level of ecological recovery in the terrestrial ecosystems but this is devastating the marine systems let me assure you we don't know what the answer is here you can see the market slicing through and helping to support one kind of system but annihilate another i'm not even getting into what it means for nitrogen transfers from the marine to the terrestrial where does that leave us we think of a notion of nature beyond borders because you can't save nature simply by enclosing it one of the reasons and i haven't dwelt on it is that this process of enclosure also creates crisis of livelihood crisis of life crisis of dignity the mori jhapi uh, massacre is well known it's been written about uh, by anu jala in the forest of tigers 1978 people who have been refugees three times are sought to be removed from a tiger reserve they resist and many die and that certainly is not a model which is just that is not a model which is democratic and it could be argued that that is not a model which in the long run is sustainable on the last the jury is out on that one it has been argued with considerable force by people like my good friend daniel brockington that authoritarian systems have in, have protected nature by enclosing it for long periods in history some of the first people to protect wild animals were the boers the afrikaners in the highlands of natal they protected rare animals like the hartebeest beast the mountain zebra and believe me they used pretty brutal means more recently the area of private game reserve in south africa is twice that of its national parks they are policed by armed guards and some of them are considering using drones oh but i would submit that at least in the indian case this larger transformation and democratic assertion makes it possible that such methods will not be sustainable that other more humane and just approaches can be tried another reason for this of course is this larger train of economic e transformations may well damage large parts of the landscape and riverscape and this cannot be halted simply through the state machinery a very good case would be the niamgiri hills there's a very nice piece in mint yesterday niamgiri mining figures in poll campaign niamgiri uh, bauxite mine being handed over to a very important world's largest aluminum company headed by a famous nri who gets full page and comiums in the economist halted only because the forest rights act provided for consultation with the gram sabha 
it was consulted, it got upheld, the Supreme Court has said yes, and this particular forest, which is a very important elephant corridor, has been secured. So, are there spaces opening or closing? Is ecological patriotism over or can we harness it to more just and positive ends? Are we at a juncture where there are new opportunities or is this another false start? What do we mean by borders? Is a border a place where there is a fundamental shift from one kind of ecology to another, one from, from one kind of economy to another? Or is a border part of a boundary? Is it part of a continuum? And is the continuum going to be the challenge in the coming year? I don't know what the answers are, but I would imagine uh, that we are in a situation where we can think beyond fortress conservation, community utopias, and simply relying on the corporates to do the job. Uh, we still are left with deeply political questions and deeply political challenges. And while there is a politics of struggle, there is mobilization, there are great injustices to be fought, there are battles to be won, there's also other ways of uh, envisioning the future and sometimes the small steps where you begin by solve by attempting to address a problem are as important as the great leaps. Thank you. That, that's a very important question, ma'am. I think the Adivasis, which means original inhabitant, yes. uh, constitute about 8% of India's population. And 8% of a billion is a lot of people. Uh, there were two routes which were attempted at the time of independence. One was to recognize that there had to be positive discrimination with representation. There are also some states in India which have been carved up uh, in order to give greater representation. Most recently, in eastern and central India, and much earlier in parts of Northeast India. Uh, the Constitution has a much less invoked provision called the Fifth Schedule. There's another called the Sixth on the Northeast. And the Fifth specifically provides for a lot of local devolution. And without going through that process, you're not supposed to mine or cut the forest or transfer land. Uh, I'm sorry to say these have largely been observed in the breach. And the process of development in the late imperial era and certainly in the years after independence, was seen as overriding uh, uh, this uh, imperative. Uh, one of the points made also in uh, Anand's recent thesis is that India had considerable success after independence in peaceful land reform, taking land from aristocracies and gentries and distributing it. Uneven, but it was there. But with forests, it was the opposite. We continued a British imperial and princely strategy of concentrating powers upward. In that sense, the Adivasis and uh, the Scheduled tribes in general have been great losers. But it could be argued, and I think it has been, that we have to qualify this picture. There are two reasons. One is that uh, from around the 80s, because we have entered a period of considerable political turmoil, Adivasi seats, which I remember 8%, and because the Adivasi percentage in these seats is large, it could be 30, 40, 50, uh, have begun to exercise some clout. This may explain why in 1982 a forest bill which had draconian provisions vis-a-vis -vis forest access rights was not even tabled. And many years later in 2006, the Forest Rights Act, which recognizes a fair measure of Adivasi homesteading rights and access rights was passed. I am ambivalent about uh, Arundhati Roy's views. I have great respect for her bo both as an author and citizen. Uh, she's a person of great dignity, of lucidity, and I've had the privilege of meeting her on many occasions. My hesitation stems, and I think she shares it in a subsequent piece after the one you refer to, ma'am. She had admitted, she, she, she said that her view was 
that the bauxite ought to remain in the mountain. And she wanted the Maoists to come out more clearly on that. I commend her views, I'm with her. My, my problem with the Maoists is twofold. One is that the forest belt of India where they operate has vast regimes of timber extraction. However, in recent years, it's become an economy largely sustained by other extraction of bauxite, coal, iron ore. Not a single mine has ever been shut at Maoist initiative. There's a reason. These Maoists, unlike the Marxist-Leninists of the 60s, are much better armed. Those arms cannot come through levies on the poor peasantry and the tribals. They are probably raised through protection money from those very economic entities, including multinationals which operate in those areas. We should not be surprised. Sociologically, if you look at studies of the Italian mafiosi, they, orig they originated in peasants trying to protect themselves from the local aristocracy. However, while protecting one, one, one set of peasants, they also became a terror to the others. This is one. The second is that some of the areas where Maoists operate, uh, there's a remarkable young conservationist called R.P. Misra, who wrote his doctoral thesis in Hindi. He worked in the University of Raipur, not one of our best universities. He was a very remarkably brave young man. Uh, he, he did his doctorate on a very rare animal, the Bubalis Bubalis, or the wild buffalo of central India. And there are very few of them. He's one of the few people who goes to the areas where they live. So the buffaloes are very ferocious. But those are areas of Maoists, and they're full of paramilitary troops as well. So I often ask him, how are you safe? He said, it's very easy. I travel at night. Because the Maoists never blow up the night buses. Many of their carders and supporters use them. And he's tried to have a dialogue. Uh, he will not admit it. I'm sure he talks to the militants. He talks to the paramilitaries. But there's no sense of recognition in them of the importance of the animal. I don't think it figures. So I'm a little hesitant. I would submit that militant, non-violent movements, not only in UP, but in large part, other parts of India, have done much more to secure land rights, protect forests, stop mining. The Vedanta case is a good one in point because the horns and the Dongriya horns did not use any violent means. We have long traditions of militant, non-violent protests in Adivasi society, which has been catalogued by scholars like David Hardiman. So I'm a little hesitant with this romanticizing of the Maoists, much as I deplore the, the, the rampant destruction of the livelihood of Adivasi peoples. On that issue, I think there is a larger constituency. And frankly, we've not yet worked out a way. We're still trying. Uh, thank you, Mahesh. Uh, this is really great. and. Uh, fascinating perspective of uh, conservation movement in India. In a way, it is somewhat surprising that it has taken so long for conservation movement in India to realize that uh, some of these strategies of fencing will not work. I think 1969 was a landmark year in more than one way. You mentioned Indra Gandhi. In 1969, if I'm correct, MacArthur and Wilson also published yeah. their theory of island biogeography, That's right. That's right. in which they postulated you cannot, you know, islands will not be able to conserve biodiversity. Yeah. Right. Mm. And biodiversity invariably will degrade mm. in small patches. Mm. Mm. And by small patches, I don't mean patches of hundreds of square kilometers, mm. patches e even of thousands of square kilometers. Mm. And I think this is still not realized by even the academic community in India when we talk of loss of forest, mm. tigers. Mm -hmm. No matter what you do, mm. I think it is something is inevitable unless there is a greater connectivity of the habitats. Sure. And unless you know the habitats are enlarged mm. by one way or the other mm. by management means. Mm. But the more important uh, point I wanted to make is that when you look, you know, it's it's political, and I think you emphasized it very well. The battles have to be won at that level. Mm. And since Mrs. Gandhi, India has not seen a leader, and that's a long, long time ago who is really committed to conservation. Look at the manifestos of the Bhatia Janta Party and the AAP and even the Congress. Mm. There is no reference to nature. Mm. Nature comes in only in the form of natural resource management. Mm. 
on all this talk of linking of rivers, Mr. Modi's comment about rhinos, rhinos is the least of India's problem in terms of conservation of biodiversity. Rhino, in fact, is doing very well by management means or others. It's the other forms of life to which very little attention is being paid. Sorry for the long comments. No, no, I, I agree with you. I think that I'd go further. I think if you look at the captains of industry and business, the slowdown of the last three years has uh, given a phenomenal opportunity to argue that environmental issues are the new uh, Im impediment and barrier to growth. Uh, they remind you of uh, American Secretary of Interior Watt, who worked for the Reagan administration. Uh, and I think we are heading for a period when the feeble controls that exist will be dismantled. But I would submit that uh, there is a larger issue here. You know, Sen famously wrote almost in the early 80s, I think that democracy is famine proof, but not malnutrition proof. It was able to take up the issues of the reform of wife murder and sati, but has been woefully inadequate in addressing the problem of gender issues. So I think, you know, democracy is good for liberty. Uh, no political system on earth safeguards liberty as well as democracy, even if democracy always doesn't do a good job. However, over the last 30 years, and this has been asked in large industrial democracies, and it is something which you do wonder when you look at India and China. I, I realize China is a one-party state. This rapid phase of economic growth, has it increased inequity? So is democracy good for equality? Maybe it can be, but right now it is not. And I would see this problem of access to nature, not only as good, but even as educational resource, as a scientific good, as a public good, as part of the problem, of the larger problem of inequity. And I'd agree with you. I think that leaders in democracies look for immediate solutions. I don't think Indian leaders are an exception. It's true in several others. But one needs to have a greater level of awareness among people. Uh, my sense, however, is that there's one small shift I've seen among Indian ecologists. Where very, you've been a trailblazer. I'm referring to the very young and young generation. That if you look at these animals you are referring to, let's say the tiger, the new work by Omar Ramakrishnan shows connectivity of tiger populations based on genetic studies in peninsula India with the northeast. The new work on wolves shows that they have large home ranges well beyond protected areas. Similar work with elephants. So this is happening without protected corridors. So we have to have other forms of cohabited landscapes. So there is something very rich to work on. As so many other things in India, we think the potential is immense, but the institutional, attitudinal barriers are very real. So how do we realize the potential and bring down the barriers, if not eliminate them altogether? That's, I, so I think it's very well put. I didn't know that this 69 point is fantastic. I mean, I, I, I'll think about it. So thank you so much. So we pass the mic along. Hi, thank you very much, Dr. Andrarajan. Um, uh, I'm a doctoral student at the Kennedy School of Government here and do work primarily on the economic history of coal. But I, I, I was interested in what the site or where conservation should be located within the state, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have this dilemma between, say, putting it in the Indian Forest Service, which historically has had a very utilitarian outlook towards mm -hmm. forests and all. I mean there are a small number of very committed individuals and a large number of people who are looking to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. You have the Ministry of Environment and Forests, which at least in the last 10, 15 years has been more or less hijacked politically for mm -hmm. largely corporate purposes, for better or for worse, I don't mm -hmm. know. And it seems to me that most of the objections historically, even over the last 100 years, has come from below, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you think of the Chipko movement, whether you think of or not below, but kind of civil society in some senses. So mm -hmm. whether it's Sunita Narayan talking about tigers, mm -hmm. yourself on elephants, kind of people outside the state. Mm -hmm. There's never been one consistent strand within the state, at least in my knowledge, which has managed to inhabit a lot of these views. Yet they're the ones who exercise most of the power on these mm -hmm. issues. So is it always going to be people sniping from the outside? Mm -hmm. Or is there some place where this is starting to happen more and more? Mm -hmm. We had a very interesting lecture by someone who has very strong views on this, Professor Madhav Gadgil. 
and uh, he did something remarkable. He wrote up a 20,000 word lecture and he wanted it distributed to everybody. So then explained this very big waste of paper. So it's on our website, you can go and read it. He, did, he had a one line answer to what you're saying and I found it a fascinating answer. Uh, he went into the detail of five existing pieces of legislation. The Wildlife Protection Act, which provides for the collector, consulting with people whenever there are impositions of controls and rights. The Environment Protection Act, 1986, which provides for ecologically sensitive areas which do not involve displacement of people. They are very controversial. Gardgill's own suggestion has led to his report being burnt in large parts of the Western Ghats. But the core, the core of the recommendation was that Gram Sabhas are to be consulted before a project is put in. The Forest Rights Act, which provides that people dependent on a forest are to be consulted. They may even have community rights of access in return for safeguarding the forest. The, there were other acts, the Bio, Biological Diversity Act 2003. These are so, all central government acts. Yes, okay. but they, they are all India acts. Uh, I think it's, while in general one believes in devolution, the reality of growth, the impulse for growth is always greater at the state level. Uh, the reason in India is that states get about 30% of the revenue, they buy 70-80% of the expenditure. So this is true in most federal societies, looking at education, police, health, forests, roads, water, it's a state subject. So I think one is to draw on the democratic, institutional possibilities within the system. I didn't refer to it. The Panchayat Extension of Scheduled Areas Act specifically provides a lot of powers locally on forests. The second, and I think it's very important, I, I like what you said about the way these institutions work. The forest service orientations go back to our good friend Mowgli. It's basically <laughs> be a revenue extraction service which has changed from making revenue by extracting the biomass to earning revenue by giving away parcels of land. It's a very important change. Such a fundamental change, they're not even recognizing it. This rapid industrial growth generates a huge hunger for land and for the minerals below the land. The Ministry of Environment has largely become a ministry for niyat and ja. That is, it says yes or no for projects. It's become a ministry for clearances and it's run by the administrative service, which again has a different orientation. I'd further add that I'm very struck in India, the marginality of the communities of knowledge. And I, I'll give two. Uh, there's a very interesting paper which a bunch of us wrote in current science. And following that, there was an article in science. I am going to share it because I'm in a university. You see, the provisions in India for wildlife research, the permits are given under the same provisions for hunting. They are hilarious. This is not in our paper, but the science article starts by naming a doctoral student who's changed his subject. He wanted to study the Malabar civet. This is an animal which comes out at dusk and is fast asleep by dawn. But the permit he was given made it very clear that he may enter the forest at dawn, but had to exit by dusk. <laughs> now, this is a very serious issue. Uh, we have, for a developing country, a remarkable number of excellent wildlife biologists, most working in public institutions and in non-profits. But it's very difficult to tap into their knowledge for rulemaking. So there were three academics on the Forest Advisory Committee, interests of full disclosure, I was one of them. We gave a formal note to the minister. Somebody leaked it. I have no idea who. It's on the web. We suggested when you assess projects which are large, don't just go to the existing institutes. It will go to a government institute, the director will depute someone, he'll come along. Pick someone who knows the subject. We, list, we said empanel these 150. The people will put in 10 days a year free. All you give them is a jeep and a guest house. They'll go and do the studies. But similarly, this, this can work at a citizen level. If you look at the very interesting work being done by very brilliant ornithologist Sohel Kadir, he does science, but he does popular science. They're creating this vast network across Kerala. It's worked very well called Climate Watch. You know, India doesn't have the kind of intensive observations of huge numbers of birds by people. They're simply observing the day the winter migrant comes in and the last day when it leaves. Now, so you have this vast population of people who are energized and active. And I think that there's a deeper problem. I'd go much further. We encounter in our institutional life, and I'm being historically specific, it may apply in other societies, a fundamental conflict between two contradictory principles of public life. One is a democratic principle, which is based on knowledge, which is based on equal citizenship and information. The other is an imperial, feudal notion of governance, 
where the government is the maiba, it is a paternal presence, and the citizen is the beneficiary. So if you get something, you're supposed to be very grateful. And you know, there's another line of Kipling where he talks about subject races which are half devil and half child. That doesn't only apply to countries which colonize each other, it may apply within countries. So this is what we confront. And I think it's changing, but I'm sure you'd agree. It's a very famous piece by Pradeep Prabhu called Decolonizing the Forest. I don't know if it's decolonizing, but certainly these hierarchies of knowledge are very closely linked to hierarchies of administration. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very difficult struggle. So I, I appreciate what you're saying. And I think there are large elements of the state system deeply invested in very destructive forms of growth. Sorry. So just one follow up to that. What are instances where you found this has worked within the state? I mean, clearly there's been lots of commissions at the state level, national level. I mean, your ta the task force you've been involved with. Where has it worked well? It has worked less at a systemic level. Mm -hmm. It has worked better in episodic interventions. But the episodic interventions are important. Right. Their significance shouldn't be undermined. In the early 1970s, there was a very important project to build a dam in the Moyar River Valley. This was halted because Ashok Khosla was on the NCPC. He worked closely with Mrs. Gandhi and they stopped it. In the case of Silent Valley, it was because of large-scale mobilization by the Sastra Sahitya Parishad and this dam wasn't built. But please look at the anti-dam movements today. The lower Subansari in Assam, in Arunachal, which will transform the landscape of the river of the Brahmaputra in Assam. Very large protests, small town intelligentsia, farmers. It's become a public mass issue. Similarly in Uttarakhand, while there is a vast number of people who want the dams because they'll get jobs and power and contracts, Following the earthquake, the realization that it's a young tectonic mountain zone is very real. And I would submit that there is space here for unusual kinds of alliances. So the Pasco plant, which has been so controversial, is part of a large complex. It includes a port which will annihilate a very important sea turtle rookery. And sea turtle biologists have been as vocal as the Marine uh, Fishers Alliance in Orissa. Uh, there are some cases, you know, I'm always hesitant about this below. I think we have an intermediate level, which links below and above. Well, Chris Bailey in his work calls it the ecumeny. I think there's a new kind of ecumeny happening in India. And there are a lot of things feeding into this. Uh, the late Ravi Sankaran, who died very tragically, this book is dedicated to him, a great ornithologist, uh, work, did some remarkable work in very difficult areas. And one of the Percy studies with the Nicobar Megapod, it, it builds a huge mound and puts its eggs, but it does something very few birds on earth do. It monitors the temperature on the mound and it shifts the eggs around. So it, it's building a real life incubator. Now the island on which it's farmed is the easternmost island of the Andaman Nicobar chain and it has the highest lookout point, ideal for a naval observatory. But this has been overruled. It's been overruled because it was, you know, conveyed with great force that this is a very rare bird. It's not found anywhere else will be annihilating a very valuable scientific resource. So I think it's a mix of these. Episodically it works. Institutionally there are fewer changes. I still think the FRA is a very positive step. In a very different sense, I think the Wildlife Protection Act was also positive. I mean it did for instance at least delist animals like the wild dog as vermin. It's a very big change for that time. So I think you know in a democracy it's, uh, you know, the Jawaharlal Nehru said that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. So eternal vigilance is the price of ecological security. Sorry. Please. You know, you mentioned something about the Indian 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 so I, I can't help but sort of think about the two examples of solutions that you gave in Bandipur. Uh, and I mean, it was also ironic in a sense because you were talking about, you were critiquing a certain enclosing of nature, but this literally was an enclosing of culture or the cultivated, um, uh, you know. Um, and But the sort of larger point that I saw those two examples make was the reducing of economic dependency on the forest or sort of a taking the forest out of the market or taking the economic out of the forest and uh, I, and I'm 
pretty sure you sort of agree with me that nothing really leaves the market in um, in the larger sense of the word. And so, how would you, in your solutions, reconceptualize that relationship between the forest and the market? Hmm. Um, and then the second question I have, which is related, is the kind of social relationship uh, of communities, not only that live along these kinds of heterogeneous, uh, sorry, porous boundaries, mm -hmm. uh, but also the larger communities that engage with these forests. Because in your answer to the gentleman mm -hmm. here, you spoke about a uh, uh, the forest perhaps as a site of leisure or scientific, uh, the production of scientific knowledge. So if you remove economic livelihood dependency on the forest through certain kinds of social initiatives, mm -hmm. what is the larger relationship with the forest that you're conceptualizing here? No, I just want to clarify that, you know, there are no solutions. There are just working approaches. And I think you're quite right to ask for larger principles. You must be very careful that larger principles in their application can be contradictory. The idea of secure zones or no-go zones pertains to a very tiny part of the landscape. It's not 5-6%, it's actually about 1% of the landscape. So, uh, even within forests, it's a very small area. Or even within non-cultivated spaces, it's a very small area. There's a much larger area where there's considerable ground mm -hmm. for trying to reconcile livelihood-based extraction with the maintenance of a fair degree of ecological integrity. My distinguished colleague, uh, much, much my senior, but he did our doctorates at the same time, N.C. Saxena, uh, co-authored a book called To the Hands of the Poor, Water, Trees and Land, and he did it in 1989, it's pretty long ago. It's a very interesting, simple conception. It's not 100% right, but it captures a large part of the truth. He argued that Indian forestry is concentrated on the stem or the trunk. Hmm? Wood, shisham, sal, teak, pine, devdar, sina. But livelihood is often about the crown. It's about flowers, fruits, buds, leaves, mm -hmm. twigs, honey. And that if you could have livelihood goods as the central focus, along with ecological security, the maintenance of the herbage and forbs, water and soil recharge. In vast zones of forests and other such natural areas, it could work. So I just want to distinguish that Bandipur is a case-specific place. You know, it's one of the very few places on earth. It's part of a complex, I want to emphasize, which has the largest number of elephants, gaur, sloth bears, and one of the very good densities of tigers in the world. So, you know, uh, I, I will use that analogy. I think the analogy which my colleague Ulas Karat, whom we often disagree with, we cross swords, when we use one of his. You know, he, he somewhere wrote that some people compare these tiger reserves to sacred groves. They call it the Ajanta, the Ellora, the Khajuraho, the Pyramid of Giza. So that's not a valid comparison. The really valid comparison is the library of Aristosthenes, which was burnt. Now, why would we be against the burning of a library? Whatever our politics, because it's a storehouse of knowledge. It's not just a storehouse of knowledge because of what's in the books. It's because of what the books represent. So, one answer to you, Elephant Task Force recommendation has not been ex uh, implemented. This one, very important. Most of us haven't. You know, we found that when David Western, who's an expat white, he's a Kenyan white, white Kenyan. He was made head of the Kenyan Wildlife Service. He found less than 5% of the visitors to Kenyan national parks are blacks. He set about to repairing it very simply. He declared all entry for all Kenyans would be free on Saturdays and Sundays and they bust huge numbers of kids in. So we suggested. You see, my view of po politics is very different. I think politicians are very responsive to steps which are popular and some things which are popular may be for the public good. We suggested clubs. We suggested Hathi clubs. Of course, you can guess what they renamed it after a famous film of Rajesh Khanna, Hathi Mere Sathi Clubs, Elephants Are My Friends. And we suggested these clubs should be established in every elephant reserve. And every weekend, they should bring children of the high schools and medium schools of surrounding areas, not just to see elephants, but to get a sense of why the wealth of this reserve matters to them. And my sense is that the products of scientific study can today be made widely accessible to such students. I don't even believe language is, is a barrier. What are the social relationships? I would prefer the word open boundaries.
the word porous boundaries mm-hmm. is coming from people who believe there should be a sanitized boundary we know sanitized boundaries don't work i mean it's in the written version you know the great wall of china mm-hmm. was a great architectural wonder but it did not keep the nomadic peoples out it couldn't they were the, 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 you know the the separation line between new and old delhi steven leg has written about this was supposed to separate the chaos and disease of the old city from the white uh, enclaves of the new city but it didn't work there there were there were commodities pathogens and people crossing so i i am i am no issue with open borders but the reality of today's economic transformation is even though the origins of these parks and reserves were in very coercive circumstances we still have to work with them i will cite for you the great statesman of the modern age uh, nelson rolila mandela you know 1991 he was released from prison before the first general elections of south africa two i think 10000 black black african black south africans went to the gates of kruger and said kruger kruger we have come for you mm-hmm. and they said we are going to tear down the gates and, and mandela made a fascinating speech he said there is no question of tearing the gates down we will open the gates mm. we'll open the gates to all south africans of all colors because kruger belongs to all of us but we won't undo kruger you know this is a very important moment when you live through vast social transformations and i like the the term used for the larger sort of backward class dalit transformation in india by jafrilo india's silent revolution mm-hmm. and and i want to emphasize you know if you look at a very interesting politician uh, mayawati Uh, when she was in power in up uh, i didn't get into it my my distinguished colleague uh, uh, dr gopi sundar works with a very unusual bird the saris crane it's annihilated across eastern india all the way to southeast asia with relatives because it's been eaten it's very common in west up <coughs> west up is a frightening area it's an area where a lot of the men are armed it's an area of extreme violence of caste and gender but nobody touches saris cranes but they're in trouble and the reason they're in trouble is they nest in the fields and they forage in the wetlands and uh, he found the mayawati government was much more open to protecting the wetlands not because they love cranes but because the wetlands are important for singhada nuts water chestnuts berries thatch uh, fish for the very poor people who are her social base similarly she was extremely supportive of the forest rights act because the forest act act provides not only for adivasis but for dalits to get rights uh, and to go further there were two man eating tigers who were one was operating in bijnor which is not far from delhi now these are tigers preying on very poor people this is getting virtually 24 hour reports on what are you doing about capturing the tiger so i am a little open about this and i don't know i let me be very clear none of us has solutions the whole world is searching for them it's true we are searching for them this is a search but we have working approaches they may work for a time in the given situation you raised this question of enclosing nature there may be ways better than the protected area to secure ecological integrity but we don't know one yet we are willing to search for them there may be there are other categories of protected areas there can be zones where certain activities are forbidden you have a no hunting zone where other but we still need these okay as far as enclosing the farm is concerned of course you have to enclose it and let me clarify why cultivation all over the world or herding any form of agriculture there are your subject you put it beautifully your subject to what ms swaminathan recently made a fantastic statement he said india has turned a corner the farmer was subject to the magic and mystery of the monsoon we are now subject to the magic and mystery of the market it's beautifully put you know the vagaries of the monsoon let me place the vagaries of the market mm. any dealing with the market needs insurance insurance in india will not insure against wild animals and damage unless you show that you are protecting the crop so while as elephant task force we favor crop insurance for farmers 500000 farmers are affected by elephant crop raids even the public sector insurance companies and banks will not insure unless they put a fence those farmers cannot afford a fence for a variety of reasons but if a group of them comes together they form what is effectively a producers cooperative they are protecting their livelihood they are not enclosing enclosing nature they are enclosing a protective space and farmers have enclosed protective spaces for centuries we can have a history of farmers fences over many years and they have to 
I mean, it's for some time. It's only for the time there's a standing crop. Then the fences can come down. Okay. Economic reliance on the forest. There are two views on this. One view is, powerfully championed by many friends in the forest movement, my very distinguished colleague Ashish Kotari, uh, many of the colleagues in HG, that you can have certain forms of extraction from the forest, which do not harm its ecological integrity. This is valid. It can work in many areas. It's been tried with honey, it's been suggested with tendupatta, and so on and so forth. However, in all of these, and I think Atri's work is especially significant, we must keep asking, is this hurting recruitment? You know, you can have a forest which is standing, the recruitment level is so low that it's not regenerating. There's a brilliant scholar called S.P. Singh who's worked on the oak forests of uh, uh, Kumar. It's very important for the Chippo movement. He shows they're dying. The trees are alive, but it's not regenerating because the grazing level is very high. So, we need modern science. The older techniques may not tell us these things. That's one. Second, even in these areas, you still need some no-go zones. There's fascinating unpublished work by Samya Prasad, where she shows that Tendupatta collection now, because the rate has been revised, the incentive is greater. The person collecting Tendupatta also wants more money. Who doesn't? So, what they argue is, in an area where you're collecting Tendu and you fire the forest floor, set aside a third, half, one-fifth for regeneration. So you need some level at which you do it. Now the no-go zone may not be done by a forest guard who comes and enforces you. It may be done locally. And all these community initiatives or popular initiatives, where they pay attention to regeneration, have either a no-go zone or a no-go season. Because regeneration is needed. Look, maybe all of this was possible when you had 20 million people on 3 million square kilometers of land. You have not just a billion people, but with lifespans doubling in the last 60 years, probably set to rise another 20 years in the next half century. And they should. They should. Why shouldn't they? Consumption levels rising. And they should. Why shouldn't they? I mean, the Indian consumption level per capita is abysmally low. The total number of tractors sold in India is 500,000. 10 years ago, it was 200,000. Now, personally, I think it's a very good idea. If, they didn't be, if the tractors were not plowing the land, they'd be plowed by bullocks and bulls, and you can calculate how much forage they would be. I am extremely serious. So I think we, we as students of history, there are unintended consequences. But I completely agree with you. We need to engage with markets. And there's something positive here. Many of these producers have been engaging with markets for centuries. I mean, if you look at the great E.P. Thompson, one of his last books, Customs in Common, is of engaging with the market. It's not of imagining a world without the market, but it's not imagining a world where we surrender to the market. So I'm sorry, I'm giving a let's avoid the extremes argument. I don't know the answer. I'm sorry, sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation and to bring us awareness about the importance of the ecological protection. <clears throat> My question is about um, the impact of the so-called Green Revolution brought to India and the ecological protection, the forest, the animals, the rivers, the water resources. Uh, we had a very interesting paper on the Green Revolution by uh, German scholar called Corina Unger. It had a fantastic title. It's called The Transnational History of the Green Revolution. And we had a talk by a geneticist, Deepak Paintel. And I must confess, when you listen to these people, you realize how ignorant you are. You suddenly realize the Green Revolution is part of a vast process. During the war, the Japanese developed dwarf varieties of rice. The Americans get into the race. Norman Bolog and friends go into it in Mexico. They tried it, tried it out in Pakistan. Then it's in India. The Chinese smuggle some of those seeds and the Chinese have a parallel Green Revolution. The core strategy of the Green Revolution was to increase output by focusing cost. Yeah, I'm just counting. By focusing <laughs> on certain limited areas where you would have higher output with much greater per acre consumption of water and per acre utilization of petrochemical feedstock. 
fertilizers, pesticides, tractors. I can only figure the Indian case. The roots of the Green Revolution are in the early 60s. The major push for the Green Revolution came because of the crisis of 66 and 67. In 1660 and 67, India purchased one-fifth of America's wheat production. When Mrs. Gandhi became Prime Minister, according to her biographer, Indar Malhotra, she told him, you are not to write this. The actual object of my visit to Washington is to secure food aid without appearing to ask for it. Mm -hmm. her, her visit was a great success. The food aid came. It kept coming from March 1966 till November 1967. November 1967, she was the only non-communist leader to be welcomed as an honored guest at the 50th anniversary of the October Revolution. And at the end of the visit, she issued a statement that India and the USSR condemn the imperialist aggression against the people of Vietnam and the bombing of North Vietnam. For the next many months, shipments of grain to India were slowed down. The same president, LBJ, who had authorized his press secretary to tell the people of the United States that he had told his daughter, I think her name was Annie or Alice, that as long as your dad is in the White House, no Indian will starve. The same president, when he went down to the basement of the White House and picked the bombing targets for North Vietnam, personally slowed down the shipments of grain to India. This gave enormous political impetus to the Green Revolution. The objective of the Green Revolution was political. It was to end Indian food dependence on the United States. Already by 1970, scholars such as Rene Dubois and Barbara Ward were pointing out pesticides would lead to long-term resistance among the pests. Fertilizers, particularly nitrogenous fertilizers, would leach into the subsoil water. The use of high degree of petrochemicals would not be sustainable in the long run. They were right. And I do believe that uh, by the early 70s, 1973-74, the Indian newspaper, The Hindu, which Ajanta has used in her research, reported something called the Hardy Guddu syndrome. It's in a very interesting uh, place called Chikmagalur, where Mrs. Indira Gandhi would fight her re-election in 1978. The landless laborers were paid in kind. They were given rice, not cash. Some of them were tenants who were marginal farmers. To supplement this very sparse diet of rice, they caught crabs, which live in the fields. And the crabs had very high pesticide residue. And their children were deformed. There were very serious diseases. Similarly, in North India, you get into a very destructive cycle. <coughs> Punjab, where Kamal Saab hails from, and Haryana, which is very close to where I live. In a very dry region of India, which is semi-arid, you get a fascinating transformation of a wheat or millet cycle into a wheat and rice cycle. Now, as you are well aware, rice, standing rice in paddy requires water. It's very water intensive. It's exhausted the water table. So there is no doubt at all that the Green Revolution has had huge impacts. It's even bigger impact is that over vast areas, particularly of wheat and rice, the, the core of the Green Revolution was wheat, it later spreads to rice. There's a very narrow spectrum of biological diversity. And this narrow spectrum of biological diversity means you have even more crop infestation. What's the answer? There are two. One is organic <laughs> agriculture. The other is GMOs. And be very clear, many GMOs are made by the same companies which make petrochemicals. However, I won't get into this, it's a different controversy. One of the advantages of the GMO bin job is that you don't have to spray it 16 times in a growing season with pesticide. It's a it tropical country. Reproduce. And then there's a controversy about it as well. I'll increase the use of is it or not? <laughs> there is a controversy, but 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 let's be clear. If you look at GM cotton, both hybrid cotton and GM cotton have enabled cotton to recover in India. It was a dying crop 10 years ago. The cotton yields in Gujarat are up sixfold. Now it's also because of water conservation, it's also because of other varieties of crop. But please be clear. The crops we are growing, even wheat are not natural crops. They are the result of selective breeding over centuries. Scientifically, when you are, you have very great scientists, you can correct me, when you are moving from 
selecting organisms to intervening with the genes you're just taking one step more it's a very important step i'm not i'm not you have to think very hard before you take it but it seems to me a lot of the criticisms of the green revolution and the gmo revolution are sociological they're not ecological they are the following it's like the farmers at the edge of bandipur who controls the seed what is the debt of the farmer mm -hmm. hmm? are they public bodies or private ones but i want to emphasize that in india from 2003 to 2011 field tests of gmos were banned europe has not banned field tests india had i put it to you seriously as scholars if you are opposed to banning a book and i assume you are if you are opposed to a court or an official telling you what you can and cannot research why are these same people silent when field tests are banned by public institutions delhi university delhi university had a professor who develops mustard seed mustard seed yields with gmo are 25% higher maybe they are very bad for the agro ecology i lied we have to keep testing whether it's good for the agro ecology but the green revolution to go back in history man do you think it's a coincidence unintended consequence that india manages to launch these large projects of setting aside forest land just at the time when it's self reliant and not dependent on american wheat otherwise it would have been like any of the sub saharan african countries and while poverty and malnutrition are widespread in india we have the capability to deal with that we didn't have the capability before the green revolution the second green revolution is even more interesting over the last 5 years pulses production is up 60% in india so i would submit that there are no ideal solutions any approach while solving one set of problems will create another set of problems we still have two fundamental problems the lack of basic income security for the indian cultivator no insurance lack of access to credit a safety net in case the market spins public institutions doing public research were the spearhead of the green revolution in india a sociological history of the green revolution would show pau hisar or uh, the vet vets of hisar the agricultural technologists of pusa the uh, wheat breeders of ludhiana the shogakin uh, uh, research center in tamil nadu were, were the cutting edge and yes it did lead to great inequities between the areas which developed and others which didn't but the second phase of the green revolution gets to small farmers it gets to bengal right now odisha assam so i am a little hesitant you know as student of history i think we should be very careful there are unintended consequences somebody does something with x but it results in y y may be benign it may be malign so i am a little hesitant i i am hesitant to dismiss the green revolution as entirely malign and i am very hesitant to accept it as entirely benign it's a mix it's a mix that is the balance because if uh, india depends mm. completely mm. on the seeds mm. and reproduction mm. and they are monopolized mm. by a company mm. what is the alternative mm. and if the mm. small farmers mm. are overpower mm. but the agro business mm. what is the solution i agree ma'am in the state of andhra pradesh the public sector company which was providing cotton seed this is not gmo this is pre gmo was wound up people became dependent on private company and it drove up farmer suicides since then they were stopped public provision but indian states can stand up if you look at monsanto monsanto hiked the price of the cotton massively five states in india which had three political parties chief minister some three parties combined and said we we'll throw you out and they brought monsanto to its knees the work of ron herring shows that in gujarat farmers have taken the monsanto seeds and bred their own see i am not so sure the monopoly will work for a different reason i use sociological reason ecological reason this is a tropical environment remember there are organisms attacking the plant at the root at the stem at the leaf there are different forms of blight it's a changing agro ecology it's changing every 2 years so then nature will will is is an ally against monopoly the <laughs> other great ally is public institutions <laughs> in public institutions indian public institutions are being prevented from in research i i am i am speaking as a citizen this is not my field of research i am very happy that field trials are being allowed i put it to you there are three routes to the gm route china which says gm food is fine 
Europe, which says we won't grow GM foods, but we'll import them. Please note, we'll import them, and our companies will do field trials. And India, which says GM in non-food crops, but not food crops. It's we're in a changing world. I don't know which of these routes is right, but but I share all your concerns. I share your concerns. As far as the Terminator gene is concerned, I think it's a creature of the internet. There's no proof it exists. We have to. We have oh. to actually wrap it up. We're yeah, already yeah, 15 yeah. minutes Thank after. You. I'm Thank sorry, you this so is much. Not my field. I, this is uh, <laughs> comments. Please. Thank you.